to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario, a beautiful Monday in the nation's capital as we record this. And a new book has just come out called The Nature of Canada. This is an edited collection by Graham Wynn and Colin Coates, and we are pleased to be joined by Colin Coates, who is in Toronto this afternoon. Colin, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Sean. So very excited to talk with you this afternoon about the nature of Canada. And you know, we were talking offline and over email a little bit. This is a book that you know, we'll talk about the process of it. But one of the things that was curious to me, I know you've done a lot of stuff in the environmental history area in your career, not only in the academic side, but sort of the organizations that go around it as well. But when you Google you, you're still you still come up primarily as a f- scholar of French Canadian history. And <laughs> uh, I, I'm just curious about this trend. Is, is this you know, from an outsider perspective, I would say this is a transition in your career, looking towards more environmental stuff. But am I wrong in that? Or what is sort of the path for you to, to come to this book? So I think that I had to be convinced that I was an environmental historian. <laughs> and and the person who did that was Alan McEachern. Uh, and he did it at the time that we were, I just moved back to Canada uh, I'd spent part of my career in uh, Scotland teaching Canadian studies over there. Um, and uh, Alan contacted me with this idea of joining the group uh, that was applying for a what ended up being a very large shirt grant. Uh, and the group came to be called NICHE, the Network in Canadian History and the Environment, which has a French title, the Nouvelle Initiative Canadienne en Histoire de l'Environnement. And uh, um, so... And I sort of said, oh, uh, Alan, I'm not really sure I'm an environmental historian. He said, well, yeah, your dissert- my, my dissertation book was out by that point. And he said it wasn't. As I reflect on it, um, I, I certainly toyed with the idea of environmental history. In fact, I went to probably just happened to go to one of the first environmental history conferences or at least um uh, 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 it was a, a, a regional meeting of the American Historical Association uh, with a particular theme on environmental history. And one of the, this is we'd be back in about 1986, I think it was. And one of the things I remember very clearly was a grad student standing up and saying to some of the, the, the professors there who were in that very new field at that point and saying, but will there be any jobs in environmental history? <laughs> um, and that, there probably weren't in the late 90s, but there certainly were afterwards. But then I and and also I guess one of the other things was um, I had read Bill Cronin's Changes in the Land uh, just at the time I finished my PhD comp, my comprehensive exams, and I was entirely enthusiastic about that. And, and in the way I, I started my PhD research wanting to do environmental history, sort of realizing that at the scale I was doing, it wasn't going to work. I didn't, the sources weren't good enough for that. But I think there's a, there's a cultural side of the environment that's part of my dissertation and the dissertation book that came out of that. And so that's why Alan contacted me. We, we knew each other a little bit, uh, before that. And, uh, he'd contacted me saying, why don't you join this group? And I thought, well, sure, that sounds interesting. And so, um, I've uh, I've been involved in that sort of organizational side of it, and I do have some projects that fit more directly in environmental history. I also have some some topics that really don't uh, fit into environmental history. So one of the things I'm working on now, I mean, there's only little bits of environmental history, and it's more on political culture in New France. Uh, but uh, so I'm still doing new, new uh, early French Canada. But I do have this interest in the environment, and I think the connection is that how Europeans encounter the new world. Uh, to my mind, that's one of the key things that uh, that brings together a lot of my interests. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things, too, that we often forget sometimes, and it's not just with environmental history. I think it's with everything, that we get so segmented sometimes to say, this is political history, social history, cultural history, environmental history, 
I mean, they're all kind of intertwined. You, you can't really have a political history of Canada without recognizing the role the environment plays. That just doesn't work. And not just in Canada, mm -hmm. really anywhere, right? The, the land, the environment shapes so much of what we do, whether it's economic or cultural or social, the land matters. Absolutely. And I, I think that you know, particularly in this current uh, period we're going through, we yes. now, well, the Anthropocene has been coming, you know, with us for some time now, but, but the, the, hu the really clear impact of hum that humans are having on the environment, it kind of awakens our, our interest uh, in what happened in earlier periods, how humans address some of the environmental challenges uh, and opportunities that they faced at that time. Um, but it, to my mind, it just is, uh, it's an essential part of that European encounter with the new world is how did they make sense of the land? Um, how did they make sense of the climate? Um, you know, in, in new France, they, tried to change the climate. They thought they were changing the climate. If they just cut down enough trees, things would get much warmer. And in a way, they had this really anthropocenic sense of, uh, of, of, of the environment, of, of, of environmental history. When it turns out the climate did warm up in the 18th century, somewhat, they were convinced that they were the reasons that that had happened. And they probably weren't because the, the scale of, of forest uh, removal in the 17th and early 18th century was not large enough to change the climate at that point. Um, but uh, ex except at a very, very, you know, very, very local level, you can you can see changes. If you cut down trees in a field, the, the snow is going to melt faster. So they could see that. Uh, but it wasn't going to change the weather. Uh, in, you know, in the sense of how long their growing season was, uh, that was happening for for different uh, uh, for different reasons. Yeah, and certainly you see it today too. Like when uh, you know you take uh, temperatures are, are often at airports, right? And airports tend to be a little warmer than other parts <laughs> of the city for a variety of reasons, right? And so you see, you can see sort of on this micro level how human beings do affect the environments wherever they are right being downtown in a city even in ottawa that's not the biggest city in the world right you can tell the difference being downtown in ottawa versus being even just across the river in gatna Absolutely. you can tell the difference and, yeah. and sort of these these created human creations within the spaces really do affect the way in which the the weather is felt by people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So so let's get into the book a little bit. I, I'm curious about the process of it. I'm always interested on collaborations because as someone who, who has been involved in academia for a while and has now uh, start, started to, to be employed more and more in non-academic work, uh, it's interesting to see the different processes at work. And this is a collaboration with Graham Wynn, a geographer from UBC, and the two of you co-edited this work. And a lot of people who folks who listen to this show regularly will be familiar with who have contributed to it, Claire Campbell, Jennifer Bunnell, uh, yourself, of course, uh, the Cruikshanks, uh, Joanna Dean. So a, a lot of people who folks are, are going to be familiar with. How did this all come together? What was your process? So maybe start with how you hooked up with Graham and the two of you took on this editor role for the book. Yeah, so Graham and I were both parts of the, we're both members of the executive of, of NICE, the Network in Canadian History and the Environment, that that group of environmental, we're trying to really launch environmental history as a, as a subfield in Canadian history. Maybe make a, a quick segue to that to point out that Graham Wynn is an historical geographer. And if you read the work of historical geographers like Graham Wynn, like Cole Harris, they've been doing environmental history since before environmental history. Right. So that's because they understand the process of change. That's a history. But they understand the connection to space and to land. Uh, so Graham, uh, you know, his work on a timber colony on on uh, uh, New, early New Brunswick was, yes, in part, you could say labor history, but it is also environmental history of a kind. So Graham and I were both part of the executive of Niche and we as Niche was. It hasn't wound down yet, but we we wanted to to uh, uh, develop something that would be sort of a statement of environmental history at a moment in time, 
Um, I'm not entirely sure we chose the right moment in a sense that we chose a time where we launched the project because this was a very, this is a project that took a long time to come to fruition. Uh, Graham and I both got very, very busy with other projects. I was uh, organizing a big uh, conference of the American Society for Environmental History, which is the biggest group of environmental historians. And they were coming to Canada for the second time, coming to Toronto in 2013. And so things like that delayed the process somewhat. But we brought together a series of people from across the country. They went either to UBC, where Graham is uh, teaching, or to York, uh, where I teach. And we wanted them to present their work on on uh, on these different themes. So we've kind of assigned themes that fit different people's work. Not everybody accepted that we invited. Uh, not everybody who initially came ended up contributing a chapter. You know, the, the, the usual things that happen along with the, uh, with the, an edited collection. Um, but we asked them to address these uh, a particular theme and to try to give it a different twist, try to give it an overview. Um, it went through a couple of different iterations after that. We had longer essays. Graham is a brilliant editor. Um, and he did, I did some of the, edit, the editorial work in the sense of cutting things down. We, we ended up initially, uh, giving the, the, the authors, I can't remember, something like 5,000, 6,000 words. And then we, then we cut it down to something like three to 4,000 words. And Graham's very good at pairing. Uh, uh, unnecessary language <laughs> out of, and really honing on the key key topics. It's a key skill if you're going to edit anything. <laughs> Absolutely, and and so um, that that was part of the process of because we really want to make this as an, an accessible book, a book that uh, uh, you know could be read by specialists in the field, we hope, but also by well certainly by undergraduates, but by anybody who's got an interest in the history of nature in Canada. Um, and again, covering quite a broad range of topics. There are topics that aren't there, we recognize. Um, and, uh, and obviously, there's lots of really good people who aren't uh, in the book. But we, we think that we did cover quite a broad range of topics. And, and we have some excellent authors uh, who, who agreed to, to join us on this journey. Uh, that, that is to say, took some time to, to come to completion. So what was that timeline like between getting everyone together and then the final product here now in, in May of 2019? What, what is the timeline that we're looking at? So I have to admit this on. on yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the initial invitations uh, were, I th I'm pretty sure, were 2011 when people started going across the country to 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 well, the two locations to deliver their talks. And then again, there was some time before the initial essays came in and then some time before the well, whole stages of revisions along the way. Because, again, we were trying to to we weren't trying to impose a voice on anybody, uh, but we were trying to make them more or less the same, uh, you know, more or less the same length. In order to make it accessible, we, we uh, deleted footnotes. Not we didn't delete them. We, we, we took them out of the um, chapters. And what each of the chapters has at the end is a, a, a essentially textual footnotes where you can find all the references, but there's nothing to dissuade the non-academic reader uh, who sees all the little numbers and gets frustrated with them, which, you know, as, as you know, from reading, whenever academic books get reviewed in newspapers, which of course doesn't happen that often these days, um, there's almost always a complaint about the number of footnotes. Yes. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, from the historian's perspective, that's what we do for a living is <laughs> yes. we, yeah. we, we document where our evidence comes from. So yeah. the, and we also get really excited, or at least I always do in like journals. If there's a really long explanatory footnote that takes up a three quarters of the page, yeah. you know, you get really excited because that's less text that you theoretically have to read, you know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but again, all the references are there. They're just done in a different fashion. It's also an illustrated book. Uh, so. Uh, uh, the authors, and then we've, we've in, in sometimes in discussion with us, we've, we've chosen different images to 
even expand the argument of the of the different chapters. So, in other words, there's a number of ways that the reader can get into into the book. At least that's what we're hoping. But I, I'm curious too. I mean, Graham, as I said, is geographer. You're a historian with that background in in French Canada, and you have people who are here. Power- Sean, are you still there? Yes, yes, I am. Can you hear me, Colin? Colin, can can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Did okay. you lose me? Uh, yeah, I think briefly there. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so I'll just start that question over then. Um, so I, I'm curious about then with the process because you have Graham, who is a geographer. You're of course a historian, as as we talked about in, you, in your background, and you look at the contributors here who are really, let's for 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 just accuracy's sake, power players within the field of environmental history. And here the two of you are now, as you said, trying to not only edit, but also cut down some of what they've done. And you know, I haven't edited that much in my day, but one of the things that I know about editing is that authors tend to be pretty protective about their work and particularly when it, in the area of cut. Revisions I've always found pretty easy, but when you wanna cut stuff, people get really protective of it. So when you have people who are really you know well known and, and established scholars is that a difficult process for you to have to go in there and suggest cuts and i'm just curious how much pushback you got and what the give and take was with the with the authors i i think that some people were more open to uh changes than <laughs> others um uh, and there was definitely a dialogue uh, as as we went through. I think that overall, the authors saw what we were trying to do. And, you know, I hope they're happy with the, the final product. Um, uh, they were surprisingly good humored about the change in in uh, word length, you know, the cutting, uh, paring it down. And I think they probably again, I, I would say I, I say I did do some of this too, but I think that Graham did a lot of the work of, of pairing uh, uh, pairing the chapters down, and really, you know, he was man- managed to do that without losing the argument of the author. So I don't think there was an imposition of voice. Uh, There's something I'm always sensitive to is that you want to protect the author's voice in in any edited collection, um, and I think the the individuality still comes through, but they are more, you know, they're very cohesive and, and coherent and really to the point essays uh, um, and, and very focused. So um, I, th- I think that that part worked very well. But, uh, you know, th- there's some people that like having their words uh, changed better than others. One, one and then and not to uh, the, the one that was uh, a little bit different was Michelle Dagenet, that she wrote her, her, her essay in French. And I'm not a translator by training, but I always think, oh, I should be able to do that because uh, <laughs> French sometimes, and uh, I think I had some really nice sentences in there, and she would say, well, that's not quite what I meant. <laughs> and after all, she's the author, so we had to work on that. And right. uh, and uh, so that was always very interesting. Uh, to uh, I'm not going to change careers, uh, <laughs> but yeah. it was interesting to, to give that a try. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm often reminded of a professor I had. Uh, I did a year abroad as an undergrad, and I was in his office one day uh, down at the University of the West Indies, and he had just had a book come out. And he he pulled it out of the box, like it had just shown up in his office that day. And he he showed it to me, and he said, when we were doing final edits on this book about a year ago, I got into screaming matches with my <laughs> editor because uh, they wanted to cut stuff and I wanted to keep stuff in. And now the book is here. I can't remember what we cut. <laughs> at all like so i mean so you go back and forth and oftentimes when you cut it's usually the best thing i i find right if you can make it more succinct especially for something like this i i saw on twitter today uh, i don't know if it was posted today but i saw it today that somebody and forgive me because uh, i can't remember who it is it said that they used this book or they were planning to use this book as part of a course mm-hmm. which when you're looking for stuff for coursework, the more succinct it is, the more direct it is, the less extemporaneous stuff that is in an article or a book or a chapter, that's good. That's what students want. And, you know, the more we can get that, the better it's going to be. 
Yeah, and, and I'm planning to use this book in my own uh, uh, environmental history class uh, that I'll be teaching next year. And uh, there are actually are some other alternatives uh, out there that also do do some of this. Uh, uh, Bill Turkel and Alan McEachern uh, edited a, a textbook uh, some years ago that also covers uh, not not these same topics, but it also conveys some of these things. It's a little bit more. Um, Research-oriented than this one is. These tend to be sort of these are really the, the a, a type of essay in the French meaning of the word. They're an argument. Uh, so I'm hoping that students will will uh, respond well to this, and we'll we'll see how they do. Uh, we'll see how it works because you never know until you get into the classroom. But I know that other people are using it. Um, some people in the states uh, have uh, said good things about the book and. Uh, as a way of getting into, uh, you know, that contrast between Canadian and American history is not always a contrast, it's a comparison. Um, but it would be interesting to get their feedback as well. Yeah, for sure. And I know, you know, I'm sure the folks at UBC Press, if you can get people in the United States to start buying this, I know they'll be very happy as well. <laughs> <laughs> Just from, from that perspective. Uh, so let, let's get into a little bit of the, the book. Uh, particular let's and let's i'm not going to ask you to speak on behalf of the authors because that's that's certainly not fair to do so let's talk specifically about your chapter which as it's listed here is chapter number five back to the land so you as you said each person was assigned a theme so for the back to the land chapter that theme what broadly were you taking what what angle was it what was your approach here so well because i'm a co-editor i kind of got to choose my <laughs> topic and it's really, you have to have some benefit for doing yeah, the job yeah um not that there would necessarily be a huge number of people who'd want to do this one i don't think but uh this is one on agriculture really and and trying to make the basic which in some ways it's such a basic point that i think we forget about it that agriculture uh is 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 at a certain point becomes the basis of the canadian economy you know we we Canadian historiography tends to focus on the staples that get exported, the non-agricultural staples, as well as wheat later on. But it, it uh, focuses on fish and furs and timber, and for lots of good reasons. Uh, they're, they're very important in Canadian history. But if you think about how the vast majority of Canadians lived on a day-to-day -day basis through much of Canadian history, they were on, they lived on farms, they, they had, and, and, and by that, they had a different connection to nature than people living in cities do. And I think it's particularly important to remind readers of this at a time when Canadians, the massive majority of Canadians live in cities. You know, we've lost that particular connection. There's still, there's still nature in cities. We've got raccoons, we've got trees, we've got, cockroaches and things like that and that's all nature right we've got we've got weather um but the people who live on farming they have a different sense of of seasonal cycles of daily cycles of connections to livestock that we we don't tend to have when we live in urban centers so to my mind this is trying to recapture um the way that for really most of canadian history the way that canadians lived that uh, their their connection to the country and to the countryside, um, and it's, I I personally think this is something that we have to keep in mind going far beyond environmental history. But in terms of politics, it makes a difference if your voters are living on the land. They 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 will approach things somewhat differently than people who live in cities. And uh, in Ruth Sandwell's uh, recent book on maybe it's a few years ago now on on the rural society, she argues that uh, Canada remains uh, a a rural country until probably the 1940s, you know, depending on how you count uh, people. But we, we often use the census definitions that make any community over a thousand people urban. Well, you know, a community of a thousand people is still pretty closely connected to the surrounding countryside. Um, and, uh, and I think she makes a good case of saying that Canadians, and we're not just farmers because there's people working in resource industries that are rural as well, but that that is a key part to Canadian history. So that's what I was trying to do. And, and the other part, point I'm trying to do is that because this is the European engagement with, with North America, is that uh, 
really there's wave after wave of Europeans who come over to, to what is now Canada to go back to the land. Some of them weren't even, the argument is for, say, New France, that a lot of the people who came to settle in the St. Lawrence Valley were actually urban uh, French. Um, but they ended up on the farms, you know, very quickly, the vast majority of the French, of the population in the St. Lawrence Valley is living in the seigneuries outside of the, the three towns, uh, Quebec, Tordivier, and Montreal. And this gets replicated generation after generation of people trying to make a living on the land. And I think that what the, um, you know, just Probably a, a, a lot of us who have, you know, whose grandparents moved to this country as, as mine did, um, uh, they, up to, you know, the early 20th century, they're moving back to the land. Even though my, my Hungarian grandfather, coming from Budapest, born in Munich and then growing up in Budapest, moves to Homestead in Alberta. And he was a, his father was a, a painter and an artist. And uh, he moves to Homestead I, in a way that I still find, you know, find absolutely fascinating. He didn't grow up on the farm, mm-hmm. um, but that is how he spent his life. And he found that a more moral choice. But I also think this for a lot of Canadians uh, who who moved to, to the land, they were doing that as a moral choice, but as a choice of a, a certain degree of independence vis-a-vis the, the marketplace. Because the thing is, if you if you live on a farm, you're not likely to starve. Right, and, and that's sort of a big thing. And and we we talk about it, looking backwards, is that draw that romance of it. And, and as you were talking, I jotted down other. As you were speaking, uh, three things came immediately to mind. You mentioned the seigneurial system, also the Dust Bowl, and the CBC as well. Uh, the creation of the CBC in the 30s, which is, I think of it because that's what I my dissertation was on. But these are three areas where politics and the environment are completely intertwined. The CBC, it's might not, maybe not as obvious, but if you look at their programming as it was devised for rural communities and for farmers, I mean, there's a, there's a clear thing there. But it, it, as you say, it goes back to this romance of it. And there's, I don't want to say a, a simplicity to rural life but i think it gets romanticized in a way that poor urban europeans were drawn over through the advertisement of land and to say that independence that autonomy that economic freedom that land brings with it and that in itself is a very political thing it's not just economic but it's also political that you're you're trying to say to people who may not have any sort of ownership or sense of ownership in their communities in Europe, come to Canada, have a sense of ownership of this, and that creates communities that are going to be ideally for the Canadian state, strong, but also motivated to support the nation and to support the the nation building endeavors that are going on at the federal level would be my, my take on it. But may, I don't know, maybe am I, am I looking too deep into the construction and how all of this works together. Well, I would argue that nation, if you want to get to nation building and say, talk about the confederation period, the key driving force behind confederation. I mean, I guess there, you want to say there's a number of them, but one of them is the idea that Ontario in particular can expand to the West you know, and displace indigenous people, bring in farmers uh, and and create this this community this economic community that's going to benefit the cities as well but but it's going to allow the farmers of Ontario of Upper Canada 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 West to move somewhere and and obtain land on their own and cheap land because of course that's the big attraction of the of, of North America in general is in comparison to Europe and you could say in comparison to Asia too land is inexpensive. It's a labor that's expensive, and that's a key driving force in, in, in the environmental history of Canada and the United States, is that, uh, you know, so you have extensive uh, crops. Uh, that makes sense economically, because the land is, isn't the expensive part, but then how do you actually get the labor to do it? That's where things get complicated. Um, and in fact, in the Canadian, you know, the nation building, early nation building phase is actually quite a bit of a failure after Confederation. Uh, there aren't that many people settling in the West. 
uh, until the building of the railroad. And then, of course, things just boom, take off exponentially after 1896 until uh, just before the First World War. Um, you know, massive, massive numbers of people moving in to to the West, many of them, really most of them, to become farmers and ending up, of course, establishing farms in areas that really should never have been farms at that time um, and and not doing very well. And that's where you know the Dust Bowl comes in and, and the, the, the settlement of marginal land really comes back to bite uh, Canada as a whole, in particular Western Canada. And I would argue ultimately leads to the increased urbanization of Canada because reali- people realize that that rural um, uh, impetus had, had reached its limit uh, by, say, the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, you mentioned indigenous people in, in this process as well. One of the things that I find interesting is that there's this romance of the land and, as we, as we mentioned, sort of the freedom of it and the people drawn to it. And yet, when Europeans arrive, the indigenous communities are generally not looked upon favorably by Europeans. And it strikes me as a remarkable contrast of looking at the land as as bountiful and, and full of opportunity, and yet the people who are living on the land are not viewed in the same way and are, in fact, viewed as really being something that has to be dealt with and removed in order to maximize on the land. Whereas from a logical perspective, if you see the land as an opportunity, why would you not view the people who have survived and understand the land as also an opportunity in a way to collaborate? And I know there's there's obviously racial elements to this, but it strikes me that this contrast is really a 180 apart from each other. And, and how do you account for that? Well, I, I would think that the, I would say that the Europeans, I'm maybe specifically talk about the French encounter sure, with yeah. indigenous people, uh, which is a more of an area that I, I deal with in my own work, um, that they distinguish between different indigenous groups. So they do recognize on some level that some of them are agricultural, right? So the Iroquoians, the Haudenosaunee and the, and the Wendat Huron are, are agricultural. And that already makes a bit more sense to them than the people they deem as hunter-gatherers, uh, like the Algonquins, uh, Anishinaabe, and uh, so on. They, and, and even those groups do practice some type of agriculture, but, but the, the Europeans don't always recognize that. But they do distinguish them. They're, they're involved in these very you know, uh, complicated and I, I would even say respectful alliances with different groups. As they're 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 trying to establish their own place, they certainly are trying to change indigenous people. But what really strikes me is how utterly unsuccessful they are at converting them. Um, which isn't to say that some indigenous people don't adopt Catholicism, because some people do. But even the, the indigenous people who live in fairly close proximity to the French live fairly parallel lives to them, which doesn't mean they don't interact because they do trade. But one of the in, in the project I'm working on now, it, it, it seems to me that the, the indigenous people, you know, one of the key things that the French want to establish to to legitimize their own state in the St. Lawrence Valley is a judicial system. The indigenous people are almost entirely outside of that. So, you know, they have their own ways of managing conflicts. They don't recognize French authority at all. And so that, that, and, and the French just have to deal with that. They'd like to be able to manage them that way, but they realize that they can't. And so there's sort of an official discourse of, of feeling superior to indigenous people. But I think that on a more basic level, the French to, a, again, it, it depends on who we're talking about among the French population, but I think they're, seeing that the indigenous people are separate but equal, if you want to say, to to them, that they live these kind of separate lives, um, sometimes in close proximity. They depend on the, the indigenous people for the fur trade. You know, it's not the French who are going out and trapping the furs. Um, and, and so they do de- develop a modus vivendi between the, the groups 
the various groups, I mean, not always, I'm not, which isn't to discount the conflicts that occur between the French and the Haudenosaunee in particular, but they, they de- develop a modus vivendi between them that, that um, doesn't displace indigenous people to, to the same extent as what's going to happen in the 19th century. Uh, in particular, when the, the, the British really and, and the Canadians just entirely changed the rules. Um, the indigenous people know pretty well what's going on and they try to fight it and they have you know, some degrees of success, but it just becomes a lot harder as there's more and more Europeans, British and others moving into their into their land and at that point really displacing them. Right. So right. how much then does that Eurocentric view uh, and then influence, as you said earlier, the use of marginal lands for mass agriculture and, and the way in which Canadians, Euro Canadians, end up trying to maximize land usage. Like it strikes me then that you know, as you were talking about, the, any sort of partnership that existed between the French and Indigenous groups really goes away and that leads to the frankly mismanagement that you see later on and that's why all these these are not all a lot of the people who come over to come back to the land as you, as you were talking about are ultimately unsuccessful mm-hmm. yeah well again it's kind of changing the rules because of right. the indigenous people different groups were mil- military allies of the british and the british north americans you know until the war of 1812 and maybe even a bit beyond that um they thought they had a deal with the British, a respect, uh, that there would be a respect of their autonomy and of their access to land. And the British just, and the Canadians just keep on changing the rules afterwards. Um, and putting them on more and more marginal land, you know, this has been covered in historiography, uh, trying to convince them to become, uh, farmers out in, in the prairies. And then when they, they become actually pretty successful, they take away their tools and, uh, they're just, and the, the problem there is that they are defined outside the polity and it's the people who have the, 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 the votes who sort of say those people can't compete with us. I mean, in fact, people do that with other groups. They do that with the, um, uh, with the Hutterites in, in Alberta in the, in the, the 20th century when the Hutterites are incredibly successful ag- agrarians. And people say, well, their neighbors say, well, that's not fair. They're just doing too well. They shouldn't be allowed to live communally. Um, and, and here you get into, you know, different types of agricultural occupation. The ideal in the Canadian context and the state supported ideal for many decades or centuries is the idea of the individual family farm. It didn't have to be that way. You know, people could be agrarians and live in villages. And go out from the villages to uh, farm their land. Uh, the Duke of Wars tried that in Saskatchewan, and they were essentially shut down. Right, uh, and they were forced. Many of them forced to move to 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 British Columbia. Um, but the so the ideal becomes the individual family farm, and that is a, a choice of a particular type of uh, of, uh, of of a society. Um, <laughs> Well, yeah, I I think within that, too, one of the things that comes up is, again, this connection between the environment and and economics. There's this view, this liberal view of the individualism and the desire to come over or the desire to control your own own space, especially in the case here where so many Europeans were enticed with the promise of land and being taken from a situation in Europe where – you did not have that autonomy. You were working for somebody else. You were not in control of your own labor, and now you can be in control of your your own labor and benefit from your work. And basically, the idea would be as hard as you work on this land, the more you're going to get out of it. And if that's really the basis upon which people are coming and the way in which the economic system and therefore the political system is being set up, you basically have to go with it as long as you can to a certain extent. And and Within that environment, I can understand why the collective might have been a little more unpopular. There would have been individuals who had pushed back against it when they're seeing it elsewhere. Like that, that just makes sense to me. 
You're talking from the state perspective? Is that from uh, the state perspective, but also yeah. from the individual farmers, right? If I come over and the idea is it's sort of this individual thing, we're all each going to have our own farm. I, I could see being a little put off by having to compete against a collective. Yeah, I mean, and they certainly were. I mean, there's, uh, again, because I, I also do research uh, in addition to working on early French Canada environmental history, I also do research on utopia. So that's why I'm talking about right. uh, Duke right. Wars and Hutterites. And there's a, a, a concerted attempt in Alberta in particular to control the Hutterites, which are, you know, one of the most law abiding communities that exists. And there's this huge antipathy from their neighbors. Uh, Again, because they're because they're successful, and now, but again, one could argue that the, the the local farmers could have established cooperatives of different kinds, and kind of patterned themselves after the Hutterites. They chose not to do that. Uh, again, I think that they, these relate to to ideological um, presuppositions uh, more than more than anything else. Um, and in the end, you know, the, the Hutterites have continued to do very well and they own big chunks of, uh, of southern Alberta as, they, as they've now continued to expand, having been regulated for, for many decades. Um, so I, I want to get into this idea to, to sort of expand on this, the imagination of it all. You know, we talk a lot in Canadian history about the environment and, you know, the, the open prairies and, and then the mountains and uh, the coastlines and sort of how great it is and, and how expansive this country is. It always strikes me as kind of counterproductive in the sense that Canadians are not as environmental from a, a conservation standpoint as perhaps we could be that on average, now part of this is climate that we use more, per capita than a lot of other countries. And I wonder what the connection is between, you know, I'm an employee of Parks Canada, so I, I don't want to necessarily get on my employer. But if you look at Parks Canada advertising, it's open spaces, lots of trees, clean water. This is how the, the, the Canadian environment is presented. And so if we're always presented with this idea of, of this clean, pure environment that is untainted i i openly wonder if it makes us less guilty or less aware of how much we actually use and then as a result the impact we have on the environment so so i'm curious for you as someone who's more involved in environmental history than me and obviously having gone through this book that does touch on the iconography of environmentalism in canada and how canadians have idolized the environment. I'm curious to know how crazy am I in trying to look at this and see if there's a connection between those two things. Well, I, I think you're absolutely right. The, the Canadian, the image Canadians portray of uh, they've got a number of ways. We've got a number of ways that Canadians we talk about ourselves. One is you know nation of the north, uh, and uh, and and this other one is that access or the the, the, the wilderness that's just out there. And those are kind of related. The, the wilderness is somewhere up in the north, right? right. Uh, north of wherever we happen to be. Well, the vast majority of us live really, really close to the American border. Okay. Uh, so the, the wilderness is somewhere up there. The idea is the wilderness is unoccupied. And, of course, this has huge implications for indigenous peoples because, of course, indigenous people live in that area that, that many of us southerners might call wilderness. I'm actually was used to be a northerner when I was a kid, but I'm a southerner now. Um, so there's, I think the, the book deals with that in a number of different ways. Claire Campbell's chapter uh, talks about the, she calls it the wealth of uh, wilderness. And, and the, she really gets at the irony of that, that the Canadians love that concept of wilderness. But in fact, they also want to have the mines and they want to have the, uh, the, the um, oil exploration and they want to have the, the trees that come from there, and that's, after all, a pretty important part of the Canadian economy. Um, and and so there are these ironies. Now, one of the things in environmental history is, in some ways, we've really tried to banish the word wilderness 
from our vocabulary because there is no real wilderness. Uh, I remember my very first uh, or maybe my second environmental history conference, I went to hear somebody talking uh, about uh, he's an environmental historian from Hungary. And he was started off by saying, you know, I've been trying to get my mind around what this idea of wilderness is. And after many years and spending quite a bit of he'd spent quite a bit of time in the States, he said, I think I'm getting it, but I'm still not entirely clear. And of course, if you say it to a Canadian or an American, they have a sense of what wilderness is. And it is that unoccupied place, but it isn't. (laughs) <laughs> it's not unoccupied, for one thing, and that's really, really essential. You're, if, if you're going in there with economic goals, you're probably displacing somebody, and you're certainly displacing other species. Uh, uh, when when you do that, you're going to have an impact. Uh, there's the there isn't there's there is no pristine wilderness out there. Um, so. Uh, uh, but Canadians really do hold on to that as a defining feature of the country. And, you know, we can go to places that look very natural. Algonquin Park, you know, is, is, uh, and, and, and I, when I teach my Canadian studies course, uh, I, you know, I show picture uh, paintings by the group of seven. Well, you know, how did group of seven manage to see those vistas? It's partly because it's been logged, right? They're looking from an area and they can see into the distance because they're not surrounded by forest. Uh, the contrast between the group of seven and Emily Carr is really interesting because Emily Carr, you know, unlike others, paints from within the forest. You know, a lot of people are actually kind of freaked out by being in the forest. They're, they like to be able to see. Um, uh, but the group of seven are actually painting a landscape that is highly modified by, by, uh, by, by human hands. Yeah, and not even to just sort of cutting the trees down, but also cutting a, tr- a trail through there and and making it accessible to people you know manicuring beaches and waterfronts and all mm-hmm. of this so all, all the things that we do to get to nature are unnatural too right and, and I, I was struck I, I can't remember who said this but it was we, we do everything we can to get to nature we get out there and then you know we complain about the bugs <laughs> or something right like we we want nature but we want it very manicured and in a way that is digestible for us like we don't want nature and everything that comes with it we want the nature that is instagrammable and none of the bad things or or the inconveniences that go along with actually being in nature and Therefore, that that's why to me this idea of Canada as a natural country and as a place that you know we just have these open landscapes that we can go explore forever and forever. I guess to a certain extent that's true. I mean, you could walk around this country and never actually cover the whole thing. It's that big, but we don't do that because there are certain the way in which we live doesn't accommodate for that. So is it really a natural country? And I I don't know, or is it simply just the imagery and the imagination that we like? Well, yes, we like, uh, it depends who we're talking about, but yes, I think that people like that, uh, the sense of of, of a comfortable nature and nature is not always comfortable. We certainly, there's actually an element in Canadian literature that really talks about the dangers of Canadian uh, the Canadian wilderness, you know, Margaret Atwood and, and so on. But the one thing I, I, there, well, I think I'd make two points is one is that assuming that, that humans have an impact on nature and that makes it unnatural, it kind of defines humans out of nature. Hmm. And indigenous people had impacts on environment, too. They set fire to forests. They set fire to forests to to encourage the growth of cranberries. Um um, a few years ago, I was on a field trip uh, out on the west coast uh, on, or the east coast of Vancouver Island and was able to see the this remnants of fishing weirs that had probably date back a thousand years um, in, the, in, an area, in an estuary where they, were, the indigenous local different, and probably would have been different indigenous nations would have been uh, uh, capturing fish with the tides, the salmon on the annual uh, salmon run. And what really blew my mind about this was the scale. This was an absolutely industrial scale of production. Um, 
So there, there's ways in which indigenous people also change their environment. Um, and I think that that's just recognizing, you know, part of their humanity too. And this is, and, and, and their, the complexity of human life. So I, w- I would just say that it's, it's pretty hard to avoid the human impact on, on the environment, even in earlier time periods. Now, it's not on the scale of the Anthropocene, of the really, the, the, the introduction of fossil fuels and the changing, uh, climate that we're, you know, we have been experiencing for some time and, and, and it seems to be, uh, becoming more and more exacerbated in, in the last few decades. But humans have always been part of that. So we're, 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 we're part of that, uh, that nature. So human modification is not in itself always a bad thing. It's the scale. Uh, and it's the implications that have to be understood. The other thing I would point out or would say is about the, you know, the question of that, say that I'm not sure if you're really referring to say national parks and or provincial parks and access to nature through those. Yes, they're kind of modified to look in, at least in some cases, they're modified to look as natural and as comfortable as they can be. But I would say that that has a good impact in the sense that it does remind people of their connections to this other type of nature and the ne- necessity of at least some degree of conservation. Um, so I think that, you know, there's issues around parks. One of the things that parks often do uh, when they're established is they, they displace the indigenous inhabitants, you know, incredibly ironically because of this desire to set up this space where apparently humans don't exist. Uh, I think that, you know, the, the, the thinking about parks has changed a lot over the last few decades uh, to get away from that. But uh, that was certainly the case for, for a long time. Get the humans out of the parks and then they're, they're better. But I think that the good, good side of parks uh, is seeing what is worth keeping and, and, and it encouraged people to develop a political consciousness. And, you know, one would hope that they convey that to their own lives in the cities that we in cities deserve to live a life with trees, you know, and <laughs> hopefully with animals. And, you know, we have to come to terms with the raccoons that we don't always like. I mean, the raccoons have co-evolved with us to a huge extent now <laughs> and the rats and so on. Uh, we don't always like that, but, uh, you know, but we have to come to, to terms with, uh, with, uh, with thoughts of that. Find ways to protect birds as they fly through cities, for instance, that's, uh, that's all good. Or, or, or keep the, uh, the the plants that the monarch butterfly can can feed off of as they make the migration from Mexico up to Canada. Um, those are things that can be done in cities as well. So, you know, there, there's there's issues around that idea of the the pristine wilderness, but there's ways in which it also can uh, encourage us uh, to to think about improving the habitat, not just for humans. But for the species that live uh, in even in urban centers. Well, I wonder about farmers markets too. Even that you know, farmers markets is a way of reminding people about the need for agriculture and, and rural lifestyles in order to feed us, right? I think you know in in urban centers a lot of the times you know you just you can go to the grocery store, but this proliferation of farmers markets maybe that's part of it too, and sort of this. Again, getting back as like your chapter is back to the land and, and sort of remembering where food comes from and the idea that, hey, just on the outside of this urban space, there are people who are growing this food and, and why not buy from them? I, that, I think that could go along in a similar sense of how urban and rural come together and, and a greater recognition on the part of urban Canadians of the need for the land and the preservation and, and that there is a life outside the city. Mm-hmm. Well, in that in the chapter on back to the land, although I start with you know the early Europeans coming to settle in the St. Lawrence Valley and elsewhere, uh, where it really ends is with the let's say the, the counterculture movement of the the 70s and 80s of people at that point moving back to the land where they were going to have their own gardens. And in a way, I, I, I think even though you know obviously a different historical context and reactions of the Vietnam War and to higher levels of industrialization and pollution and that. But some of the same impetus is what, say, the early French settlers or those uh, settlers going to the prairies in the late 19th and early 20th century, what they were experiencing is that idea of at least some degree of independence, of really having that connection to seasons, 
to um, uh, and to the food that they grow because at the end we all <laughs> that, those are things that we all need to we all, all need to take on board regardless of where we live absolutely, absolutely. Uh, now I, I want to ask you this uh, I'll get you out of here on this uh, as I've taken more time as I as I always do. I, I always tell people that we're going to go about forty minutes, and then I always take inevitably way more time than I tell people I'm going to take. So uh, so I'll, I'll finish with this, and, and I'm curious, as someone who is is an environmental historian and has studied a lot about the environment, when you look around today in in the contemporary sense, and and I don't necessarily want you or need you to take a partisan perspective on this, but are you optimistic about how we in this country treat environmental issues and and approach environmentalism and the relationship with the land in 2019 and are you optimistic moving forward oh i'd like i'd like to be optimistic i mean there's certainly there's a lot of discouraging signs out there these days and maybe i can give a clear answer after the next federal election um i mean a lot of our provincial elections have gone in ways that i just don't think are good for the environment and i i do think people are reacting in a very very short-sighted way um, it's interesting how people are mob or you know some groups are mobilizing essentially moral language around you know I should be able to drive my car with cheap gas because I want to take my children to their hockey games you know which is probably a good thing to take your children to this so they can play hockey um, but but it, it's interesting I find how that kind of language is being uh, being being used. Um, uh, uh, today, you know, there are uh, lots of other changes that are occurring out there, one of which is the development in, in uh, relation to cars is the development of, of electric cars. And that, that you know, that there have been discussions of that for decades, but we are getting to a point when we're going to see an increasing number of electric cars and as a result, less pollution uh, when they really come on board. How far away that is, I don't know. I mean, again, some of the recent elections make me think we're a little bit farther away from that than I would prefer. Um, but at the end of the day, we only have one earth and this is our best choice. And, you know, people will <laughs> have to come to their senses. Um, yes, I would prefer that it happened earlier rather than later. Um, and, uh, uh, there certainly is some discouraging, uh, some discouraging signs out there, but, uh, one has to remain hopeful. Yes. Uh, absolutely. There, there's sort of the saying that there are two things in this world that are undefeated. That is time and nature. You can't beat either of them. So nature uh, will bite back. <laughs> yes. At some point it will. It, it just as time gets us all at some point, nature bites back at some point. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, so the, again, that's why people should get the book and, and really look into how Canada and, and our history is so tied to nature and again the book is the nature of canada edited by colin coates and graham Wynn from our friends out there at ubc press and i have to say colin too not only am i impressed by the number of people in this and i i as someone who has taken a long time to write a book i appreciate that it took a long time uh and, and you know we had raymond blake on a couple of weeks ago and he talked about how fast his book was and i think that made a I lot know. of people mad i think <laughs> that, that this one took as long as it did will make a lot of people feel really good about their own their own uh, processes <laughs> that's a bit of optimism yes uh, yeah. there, there's light at the end of the tunnel <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, but i'm also impressed too with the price too for an academic book with all these people and all the 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 sort of stuff that goes along with that you know, with all due respect to a lot of the academic presses, they tend to price out a lot of folks. This one is not priced. This doesn't price out really that many people. Uh, you know, it's a reasonable price for a book. So uh, congratulations to you and UBC Press for however that was accomplished, but well done. Well, they had good, good, co good cooperation with UBC Press on this, and we really appreciated that. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, so everyone, please do uh, go check out the book. And Colin, thank you so much for the time this afternoon. Okay, thank you, Sean.
If you have any questions or comments for the show, you can find us at Game or at, uh, geez, at Game of Stones. That's the wrong show. At History Slam at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter at Dr. Shawnee Fever. Also, please do subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you get the show. Give us the ratings and the comments that helps other people find the show and keep us going on there. So, uh, and also check out ActiveHistory.ca where we got a lot of great content from the theme week that we did a couple weeks ago uh, and some great stuff coming up over the summer. So do check us out there. And we'll be back with a new episode in a couple of weeks. But until then, if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.